setting new standards in podcast excellence. You have joined the WBT, fully focused on business and taxes. Here is your host, Michael Lodge. Welcome to the WBT. This is Michael Lodge. I'm glad you've joined me on this Sunday mid-afternoon. Beautiful day here on the East Coast. Well, in sunny Florida, I should say. It's okay. So what is our conversation going to be about? Well, today is going to be about the coronavirus and the damage that it's doing to our nation and to families. I'll be right back right after this. Listen, if you are having a family crisis, dispute, conflict, contact me. Send me a text at 818-252-5682. I'm a certified mediator, and I can help you. This is Mike Lodge. Contact us. World of business and taxes on I don't think a lot of us really realize how much damage that this virus has done to our nation. It's not just the virus, but it's that lockdown that has locked us into our homes. Like we're prisoners almost. Taking away our freedom to talk to other people or to associate with them and to talk with them. And to have this closeness that we used to have. It's completely destroyed our businesses. We in small business have been hurt greatly from it. No cash coming in. How do we survive? That's the question. That's the question that's on our mind on a daily basis. What am I going to do? Because government has us locked down. I want to play a story that's just recent from a father who has lost his son because of Corona. Let's just take a listen. Let's just take a, a moment and feel for this father, pray for this father, but listen to the story because it's happening every single day. Day two. So I buried my son. My son died from the coronavirus, as I mentioned, but not in the way you think. Human condition is not to be socially isolated. And even I heard someone say, well, it's like summer for these kids. It was, it's not like summer for these kids. It's just not. Anybody says it's, it's an idiot. This is not summer. You have parents who are stressed out because they lost their jobs. That's not like summer. You have kids who have no interaction with their friends other than through Fortnite and FaceTime. That's not like summer. You have kids who can't go, go run off their energy at PE class. They can't get that one hug from their teacher that they needed. Um, there, there's social and emotional challenges beyond comprehension. And we're only going to begin to understand the effects, and it will be hard, incredibly hard to track and incredibly hard to prove my thesis um, because the network effects of how this all happened, the butterfly effect, is, is too complicated. But my belief is... We have a bubble, a social and emotional bubble, what's about to burst. And it's been coming for a while. I think Hayden was an incredible kid. He wasn't depressed. Uh, he wasn't uh, someone who uh, moped around. I mean, like any teenager, he was hard on himself at times. Probably a lot, a lot like me, pretty competitive guy. Um, and like anybody, had his own, his own insecurities here and there. My son, the story behind my son, for those who want to know, back in December, he got a brand new monitor for Christmas. That's what he wanted. He was a big, big time gamer, and I got nothing wrong with gaming. Uh, that's what he wanted to play Fortnite. He's an incredible Fortnite player, one of the top for his age in the country. And um, I'm very proud of that gift. And that one of those wonderful for a couple months, right before the fires just started. 
back in February, like like I used to do when I got mad at uh, Mike Tyson's punch out or whatever it was. Um, he got mad at Fortnite, turned around and chunked that controller over his head again, just like I used to do, and um, hit smack in the middle of that monitor, broke it. And we told him, son, you know, you can't do that. I don't care about the monitor, but I care about how you react. It's just you can't do that. When you're not getting another one. Sorry, dude. Um, and, you know, he negotiated and tried every which way to convince us, talking to my, what we call, my, my dad, we call him Pee Pee, um, trying to get him to fix it. And he can't fix those new LCD monitors, um, or not cheaply at least. And, um, but we said, you know what? If you, the opportunity to, to learn a lesson, do some hard work of your own, do some more chores around the house, you treat your sister nicer, um, maybe we'll talk about it, we'll get you one. And he held up with his end of the bargain. Um, February, Mar March, he worked his butt off. Um, did some things around the house, did many things around the house. Was, I could see it, just a wonderful change in how he treated his sister, which brother and sisters always fight. There's nothing unusual about that, but he's learning. He was evolving. He was growing. He was becoming a man, a 12-year-old boy. And, uh, you know, a week and a half ago, we had a wonderful day. Um, where me and Hayden were supposed to go get haircuts at my office. Um, both of us were getting shaggy as can be. And um, my water in my well went out. And, uh, you know, I needed help to fix it, so I called the smartest guy I know, which was my dad. Um, and I hadn't seen him because of the virus. I hadn't allowed him to go to work. I said, you got to work from home, man. I was worried about my dad just like everybody else. Uh, but he came over, helped me fix the will. It was a beautiful sunny day. We had a glorious time. Me, Hayden, him fixing it. My dad even gave him a little mission that he had to watch something on the well. He was real proud of that. And I remember Hayden coming from the kitchen. I gave him the biggest hug and I kissed him on the hair. I hugged him tight for some reason. I didn't know what would be the last time I'd hug him. My dad did the same and we talked some more. And Hayden went upstairs to his room. Um, and um, my dad had to go. I had to take a phone call. Um, April went to go um, pick up a friend. You know, the social isolation, we kind of reached a point where we felt like it was counterproductive. So we are going to let our other friend spend the night and they were going to get some food. My dad left. April left. I went into my room real quick. Just my little daughter, me and Hayden were at home. I took a call. It took about 25, 30 minutes. Walked outside and... Uh, my uh, eight-year-old daughter came down the stairs and said, hey, did hung himself. And I ran upstairs. <sighs> I tried. I want nobody ever feel this, to see what I saw and to feel this pain. I want nobody. <laughs> and as we found out, you know, we were in shock the first couple days. Just, just how, where did this come from? How this happened? I'm a horrible parent. I'm horrible. And uh, come to find out that he had broke his monitor again. Broke his monitor again. And in a just a rash of, of emotion and probably anger at himself and. They were scared to get in trouble and embarrassed and all these emotions. You know, I went in his closet and rudimentally did something that I, I know he regrets. The kicker of it was, it was three days before his 13th birthday. And he was so excited about that birthday. Um, so excited about his birthday. And he was going to get a controller, some new controller that was going to really make his game xbox game better or is that fortnite became better and um and so when he broke his monitor i believe he felt like he ruined his party he ruined his birthday he already couldn't have a birthday party because of social isolation imagine that as a 12 year old boy you know that's just that's got to be those are the things you look forward to as a kid and then you then you and you accidentally ruin it because you break your monitor and you aren't gonna be able to use your birthday present here in a couple days and you can't go see your friends um, and you're, you know, you're stuck. You didn't have PE class to run it all out. And, you know, you know, all those things. Everybody's playing Fortnite across the country. Kids are staying up later than they are. So they're, and again, they, they, have, they don't have the skills. 
we as a society, me as a parent, us as parents haven't necessarily given them all the tools to, to properly handle. And in that moment, you know, probably not understanding the, the finality of the situation, went in the closet and got himself in a situation I believe he couldn't get out of. Um, and might have been, been, been an accident. My eight-year-old daughter saw some of it. We don't know exactly what. What the counselors, professionals help us in that. Um, but I know she, when she saw blood coming out of his nose, she came and got me. She did the right thing. I don't think she even knew what, what was happening. She knew blood. She came and got me, ran upstairs. I didn't have my cell phone on me. Um, and I told her, go get my cell phone downstairs. And she ran downstairs just like an amazing human got it for me and I, and I happened to have an AED an automatic electronic defibrillator in my house and I said go get that medical thing out of the pantry she never seen it didn't know what it was and she brought that to me very proud of her she was ready to she was ready to execute um, and I said hey you go outside and go I had called 911 about this point I said go outside keep the door open and wait for the cops um, wave them down she ran outside as fast as she could um, one thing I'm just immensely proud of her about is during that moment, about a year ago, we had done some training in my house, I'm a West Point grad, and um, probably could have should have done more training, but um, I said, hey, if there's ever an issue, you go run over to this guy's house, and if there's ever another issue, you go, or if you can't get him, you go run to this guy's house. And rather than just waiting outside, this little girl, eight years old, eight years old, eight years old last of September, ran to my neighbor's house, got my, my neighbor, ran to the other neighbor's house and got them. As I was given CPR, I was on the verge of collapsing. I literally was on the verge of collapsing. I was praying to God just to give me the strength. I never knew how hard that is. Um, and out of nowhere, and all my, my neighbors appear and help me take over and help me help us try to save him. Um, social isolation is hard enough for adults. It's even more hard for our kids. And um, I have been saying COVID killed my son. I believe it, but not how not how we think. I believe my son would be alive today if he was in school. And that's not to discount the massive suffering around the world around this virus. I thank you all for listening to me. This is I need to get this off my chest. I'm now one of Hayden's soldiers, who is a soldier of God, um, and. It's a horrible tragedy. Um, I'll be damned. I'll be damned if, if I don't make this a little bit better. And politicians, for those of you who um, made the decisions you made, I know, I'm not, I know you're not perfect, but there's got to be accountability. Um, not, not accountability like I'm doing in a bad way. Accountability in what's, what's legally right, my, my rights as a citizen just to speak out, just to influence change. And if I don't think you're a good enough leader, I can spend my pocketbook and my time and my effort to get you out of there. <laughs> I don't want my son to just remember to be the last mistake he ever made. <laughs> Nobody wants that. I don't. But I want his memory to be that smile. I want his memory to be his heart, his dedication, his tenacity. Um, and I want his memory to be he made a big difference in the world. A little flame spark around the world. I love you all. Thank you all for your support. All my friends, all my family. Um, and buddy, see you soon. Peace, guys. So what do you say to that? Isolation. This lockdown has done so much damage to businesses and families and children, kids that cannot go to school any longer and are in this isolation point in their house, playing these video games and trying to make life roll on, but it's not rolling on for some. And for the adults out there, it's even tougher because they've got even larger responsibilities. I've got these responsibilities of bills that need to be paid. 
children that need to be fed, grandparents and parents that need to be watched over. And they're isolated in these homes without any place to go. I agree with the Father that the government has a lot of responsibility. And they have to answer to this. There was another way that they could have gone. But they chose to be a government that wanted to oppress, destroy, take down businesses, take down families. Because they wanted to be in control and they wanted to be right but they were wrong. And that's where we stand today with a government that has out of control. If you look at California and Gavin Newsom and you look at, at the city of New York and what they're doing to those people there, where they are literally having armed police officers standing in front of them with batons ready to pounce on them at any given moment just because Americans want to express their dissent on what they feel the government is doing. Gavin Newsom has decided to take over the state of California and rule it with an iron fist and not with a warm heart to try to help Californians. In the state of New York, Governor Cuomo has done so many has made so many bad decisions that it has put more people in harm's way. The Trump administration tried to help out New York, and they they took down they took down ships, huge ships that could house two thousand sick people all at one time. They were not filling up the boat. They didn't have the numbers that they said that they were going to have in sick people. So they started moving the coronavirus people out to the boat. And well, I think they had like one hundred and thirty four people out there, out of two thousand beds. And the story gets worse as Governor Cuomo sent coronavirus people to skilled nursing facilities and create even a wider spread of the virus. Because skilled nursing facilities don't have disease control and all the other as- aspects of containing a virus. Government in New York and California and other states that are dominating their citizens and stepping on their constitutional rights of the ability to dissent, disagree, to assemble and to march. They want to shut them down. They want to shut their voices down. Even Facebook, even Google, even even YouTube are trying to shut down the voices of people dissenting against the government which is what the Constitution was about, providing the ability to speak out, the citizens to be able to say what was on their mind and how they felt. On this Sunday, I hope that you sit back and you are thinking about what the Father said, how it has affected him, how mental health is a big issue in the United States, and every time something happens to big to mental health, politicians point in another direction instead of heading it on and trying to take care of the situation. Government probably should not even be involved in our health care decision making process because they they screw it up every single time. We're a great nation. I love our country. I love the people. I love the diversity. I love to sit down with people at a coffee shop and talk to them about whatever is going on in their life. Over the last few days, a couple of weeks, I've been talking to people. I said, listen, if you need somebody to talk to, if you are feeling depressed, if you feel like you're lonely, send me a text. I'll put that number out, 818-252-5682. Send me a text and I'll find some way to get you to talk to me on my Zoom account so that we can talk face-to-face. I'm a mediator and I talk to people all the time. But if you really do need someone to talk to, 
please talk to somebody. If you feel down or depressed, reach out and talk to someone. Even if it's just to cause a fight, talk to someone. Get your mind off of something that's going around and around this fear, this panic, this misunderstandings of what's going on with this coronavirus and what the government is t- telling you. We started this journey together as a nation based on what came out of China, based upon what the World Health Organization led us to believe. And then we started to receive data, and the data was wrong. It was bad data in, bad data out, bad policies being made. They said that 1 million people were going to die, then 200,000 people would die, then 60,000 people would die. Now we're down to 30-some thousand people projected to die. And yet we can't open up our businesses. We are stuck because government has a hand on us. I'm very thankful to the people in California who were out demonstrating this weekend. Those that were up in Sacramento at the steps of the Capitol and there were police force in front of them with batons and shields and ready to fight them. It went by peacefully because people went there in peace. People went there with the hope of making their dissent known. Finally the police walked away. So we're in our silence. As we sit in our homes today or we're driving along or riding a bike or walking, if you're listening to this podcast, know that you are an American. And know that we as a country will pull together, but we have to weed out those that want to do harm to it. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of weeding that needs to be done. A lot of weeding. Get your get your hose out. Get your shovels out. Get your picks out. Because we got a lot of digging to get these people out. So much damage has been done to this nation by people who have a different philosophy about what America should be. And we have this discussion every single day, and there is dissent. And I love dissent because it brings up the aspect of talking about other people's views. But then at some point in time, we have to make the decision as Americans what is right for our country and what is wrong. And I think that we know, based upon this coronavirus, that the overreach of government is wrong. Yes, there are people who died from the flu, from the virus, and from flu, and from heart disease, and from diabetes, and from suicide. Suicides are up. Drug overdoses are up. People in families are being poisoned by chemical reactions because they're mixing stuff. That is up. There's more family fights that are going up. Because it's, you see, isolation is not what people are about. We were never meant to be put by ourselves because we will go crazy. But that's what government has done. They've put us into this isolation booth and wanting us to sit there until they say it's time to go out. I saw a restaurant in Northern California that said, you know what, if I don't open up my restaurant, I'll be homeless. I won't have a place to go. So on Saturday, she opened it up. Over 100 people showed up, all sitting by each other, all enjoying it. They were happy to be out. They were happy to once again be acting as normal. People know social distancing. We know that. But it's not up to government to tell us what we can and cannot do when it, come, when it comes to fulfilling our lives and trying to sustain our families and trying to bring in food and money to pay our bills. 
The government has no right to tell us to stay at home. There's no constitutional and there's no scientific reason to do that. We are now controlled by a government that is out of control. We are a really great nation. When something goes bad, we know how to come right back up. But, this, but if government is going to hinder us or put a stop in front of us, then we have to rise up and we have to take government back. That's what our Constitution was made for, to protect the American people. The First Amendment gave us a whole bunch of rights to protect ourselves. The Second Amendment also. And you have these governments in New York, <clears throat> in California, other small states that want to dominate their citizens. They don't care about them. They don't care that they're losing their businesses. They don't care anything about that. What they're concerned about is the power that this virus gives them over other people. So they are not going to make decisions based upon what your needs are or what your concerns are or that you're losing your house or that you're losing your business or you have zero money in your bank account anymore. They don't care. Because now it's not about a virus. Now it's not about isolation. Now it's about political power. I've always said that if any individual is pushing a political agenda, walk away fast with him because it's not going to come out good. If he or she is unwilling to listen to the American people and know what their concerns are and what they're trying to do every single day to try and survive, if they don't care about that and all that they care about is their political agenda, it's time for them to go. It's time for Gavin Newsom to go. It's time for his Democratic legislatures to go. It's time for Governor Cuomo to go. And it's time for de Blasio to go. It's time for Pelosi to go. It's time for Schumer to go. It's time for these individuals who are fighting against America and not for America. And that's what we have in these individuals. I know some of us when we mention the word Trump, people go nutso. But I hate to tell you tell you this, Trump was right. There is a dirty, rotten, corrupt political mess in our nation. And it's those individuals who want to fight against what our Constitution says and fight against you and I because they're so concerned about their political power than anything else that puts you and I in danger. Now I know a lot of the states out there have said lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. They've sent their police to the beaches. They've sent their police to the state capitals. They're passing out masks and telling people in New York parks, don't be there. And they're telling businesses to remain closed until we'd say it's okay to open. I say to you that it's time to open no matter what government says. It's time to go to your business tomorrow on the beautiful Monday. Take the keys and unlock the doors. Turn the light switches on and say I'm open for business. If I don't open my business today... I'm going to go hungry. My family is going to go hungry. My employees are going to go hungry. My children are going to go hungry. I'll go bankrupt. So I think it's about time that you and I, we stand up, fight back. We decide that our businesses are ready to open. We know the precautions. We know what we need to do to remain safe. We also know what we need to do to be able to survive. We know what we need to do so we're no 
that we do not go into a homeless situation. And that means we have to open up our businesses. We have to get back. We need to send all those kids back to school. We are the Americans. We are the people in charge of these politicians, even though they think they're in charge of us. They're not. We are in charge of our country. They are there because we put them there. Those politicians are sitting in their offices getting paid right now while you and I don't get paid anything. They're getting paid. Their staffs are getting paid. They're still getting their health care. They're still building up their retirement funds. So if they're able to do that as politicians, then we should be able to do it as American citizens and get our companies back up and running. So I say to you today, Americans, rise up, open up, and get your businesses back to business. Schools, open up. Get your kids back into school. Listen to the father that we heard at the very beginning. He's asking you, open up the schools. They need to be back in school. Listen, I extend this to you again. Any of you who need to chat, you need someone to talk to, my Zoom lines are going to be open all this week. 24 hours a day. I used to do it at night time. It's open 24 hours a day now. Send me a text at 818-252-5682. If you need some help, if you need to talk to someone, I'm here. I'm ready for you. Don't feel that you're alone. You might be stuck at home. Listen, I have been in this house, in my house, for weeks now. Only venturing out to get food and venturing out to go to the post office which is only two blocks from me. I've been locked up also. But luckily I'm busy. I have lots of things to do. I wrote two books. I, I uh, am doing tax work for clients. So I'm busy. I've got these three dogs that hound me all day long. I have been busy. And I've been out going for walks. But I know there's a lot of you out there that have not had that opportunity You've been watching, sitting in front of that television all this time, and maybe you're talking to, <coughs> excuse me, you're talking to a few friends, but you've been isolated. So anyway, I offer that to you. You can take it or leave it. Again, the text is eight one eight two five two five six eight two. I want you to go out today. If you own a business, open your business tomorrow. Don't let government. Shut you down. You families out there, go out there. Walk. Do what you have to do as a family. Don't let government shut you down. Churches, open up your churches again. Don't let government shut you down. Because that's a constitutional amendment right there. Freedom of religion. Americans' freedom of speech, freedom to assemble. Do not let government shut you down any longer. Rise up, get up, open up, and let's get back to business. This is Mike Lodge. I'll talk with you very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The WBT with Michael Lodge. Join us again tomorrow as we explore more about business and taxes. Follow us on iHeartRadio. And go to our podcast website at www.wbtpod.com and listen to all of our podcasts and read our blogs. This podcast has been produced by Michael Lodge, fully focused on content.